Hello, my name is Ian Sinjin and I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest in our series of Sinjin's Pipecasts. Our subject today is the philosophical ideas of T.H. Green, a huge influential philosopher and ethical and political theorist in late Victorian Britain. He's probably best remembered today for his concept of positive freedom and his contribution to the development of the new liberalism of the late 19th century with its support for state intervention in society to enhance the freedom of individuals. Now Green was a pioneer of the idealist movement in British philosophy. This was an attempt to apply insights from German philosophers such as Kant and Hegel to a British context in the process challenging the hold of the empirical tradition in British philosophy, which could, which could be traced back to Locke and Hume, and which by the mid-19th century was associated with the work of John Stuart Mill. Green, who was a religiously minded philosopher at Balliol College, Oxford during the 1860s and 1870s, wished to challenge both the empiricist theory of knowledge and the utilitarian approach to ethics as the endeavour to maximise human happiness. The philosophy of German idealism provided him with tools to mount such a challenge. Now Green's metaphysics represent an attempt to define the nature of reality and man's relationship to it. Green developed his ideas not so much as an end in themselves, but rather to provide the foundation for his own personal priority, namely to develop a theory of ethics as guiding the moral behaviour of individuals and the state. The basic claim of Green's moral theory is that the goodwill is one which seeks to promote the common good of all members of society as a means to the self-realisation of each. This rather sweeping claim emerges out of Green's metaphysics. And once Green's metaphysics are accepted, the morality of the common good develops pretty much logically. It is no accident, therefore, that Green's metaphysical ideas are developed in the first part of his Prolegomena to Ethics, which was published in 1883, the year of his death. My own personal edition is the dates from 1884, uh, it's the second edition from the, from the next year. This particular one was owned by a gentleman at a place called Seabury Hall in America. Um, in 1888 he paid the princely sum of $2.80 for it. I paid £11 in Britain about 100 years later. The second and third parts of this work build upon the first part to expound a theory of free moral action and the social or common good. Today I propose to outline the first metaphysical part of Green's thought, which relates to the ultimate nature of things. Green builds his metaphysics, his understanding of the nature of reality, from experience, our experience of the external world. His method is the critical method derived from Kant, namely to deduce the necessary character of the world through reflecting upon what must be true if we are to have the kind of experience of the world that we in fact do have. Now Green begins therefore with what for him is experience in its most basic form, the object of perception. This for Green is the basic unit of experience. Like the British empiricists, he believes that objective ex perception originates in sensory impressions, a triggering of our senses by some external event. But whereas the empiricists held that the basis of experience was units of sense data, Green argued that in experience we never encounter raw sense data. What we experience are objects of perception. 
We don't see patches of colour, brown and blue. We see a book lying upon a desk. We experience trees and houses, pens and motor cars. And we don't see any given object like a book in isolation. We see a book upon a table next to a lamp in a room lit by a window through which we can catch a glimpse of a tree. In other words, we don't see an isolated patch of colour. We don't even see a mere object. What we experience is always a world. The reality we encounter to experience is, in Green's words, a unified and systematised manifold. This is the real world we inhabit, a world of interrelated objects of perception. So what, says Green, must be true if such a world is to exist at all? Well, according to Green, four things must be true of the real world we experience. It, sorry, four things must be true for the real world we experience to exist as we experience it. First, there must be, and there must exist, continuous consciousness. If the world of experience is to exist, there must evidently be a conscious experience to experience it. This is of course true by definition. Did it imply something more? If the objects of experience are to constitute a world which is continuous and not simply a series of disconnected perceptions, there must be a continuous consciousness to which they exist. There must be a single principle of consciousness which unites the particular perceptions into a single world of experience. There must be a self, a continuous I think which makes continuous experience possible. There must be a continually experiencing subject, which is not the object of experience, but the condition for experience existing at all. Now this idea Green took from Kant, who called the continuous connected stream of experience that characterizes our world, the transcendental unity of our perception. For a succession of events to exist as a related series of events, there must be a single consciousness which exists through them all, and holds the series of events together as a series. Experience presupposes consciousness, it does not generate it. Where Green differs from Kant is in his understanding of the status of the world we experience. Kant recognised the reality of the world of experience, which he called the world of phenomena. But he argued that there must be a world beyond phenomena that generates the raw material out of which the world of phenomena emerges. And this he called the world of noumena. Noumena is constituted by things in themselves. Phenomena by the world as they exist to us. Kant argued that we could never know the noumenal world, for we are confined to the world of experience, of phenomena. Now Green simply discarded any talk of a world of independent, of ex independent experience. Such a world, he said, we could never experience, and therefore could not know. It was meaningless even to talk about it. All we know, and all we can know, is the world of experience. And this is the world of reality, the world we experience and which we live in. Reality is, and can only be, the world of experience, the world of the continuous self-consciousness. The second thing that follows, says Green, from the fact of experience being a system of relations between objects, is the role of consciousness in making and constituting this experience. 
Consciousness is not a passive process that simply takes objects of perception fully formed. Consciousness is constructive. It takes sense impressions and organises them and brings them into relations to make a world of objects. This is Green's famous doctrine of relations. The essential feature of experience, says Green, is that everything exists in relation to everything else. There is no such thing as a simple atomic fact. Green illustrates this by the concept of a series. Consider a series of repeated events, like the chimes of a clock. When we hear each separate chime of the clock, dong, 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 each chime does not stand alone. The mind contemplates them as a whole. So when the chiming ceases, we say, ah, it is ten o'clock. Of course, the clock doesn't chime ten as such. It is to the conscious mind alone that it chimes ten. Green held that all experiences of this nature, an object such as a book, is constituted by our minds, out of a series of aspects, shapes, colour, dimensions, texture, which are held together as an object by our consciousness. This object, such as a book, is then situated on a desk, similarly constructed by us and held in relation to the book, again by our conscious minds and so on. It is the mind that brings order to nature, situating events in time and place and sustaining the system of relations which together makes up the conscious world. The interrelated world of objects does not flow into our minds fully formed and complete. Rather, it is constructively made by our conscious selves. Hence Green's dictum that mind makes nature. Reality, in other words, is mind dependent. It exists in a conscious experience which constitutes it holding together the separate elements of sensation. The third thing that follows from experience is that the real world of experience is objectively true. The world truly is as we perceive it to be in consciousness. We know this to be true Green says, because the relations we experience in the world are stable. The relations we perceive and experience do not come into existence only when we perceive them and cease to be when we do not. The book was on the table before I perceived it to be and will be there when I turn away. Green illustrates this by pointing out that it is possible for our experience of the world to be wrong. An engine driver may think a signal says green when in fact it is red and the result, sadly enough, is a crash. The driver's perception was wrong. In his world of experience the signal was green but in the actual world of relations the signal was red. Reality exists independently of our personal experience and we can be wrong in our understanding of it. The final thing that Green deduces from the fact of our experience of the world as a world of relations between objects is the existence of a cosmic or universal consciousness. For Green, the existence of a conscious organising mind is necessary for a world of relations to exist at all. Our own world of experience is constituted by our own self-conscious mind. But there is, he says, as we just discussed, a world of relations independent of our own minds. And it therefore follows that there must be a conscious mind holding these objects in relation to each other. The external world of stable relations can only exist if a consciousness structures it and holds these relations together in a single world. There must, in other words, be a single cosmic consciousness that is not an object in the world, 
but is the rational principle that underlies the world, the physical objects as a whole. It is this mind which orders reality in time and space, which, constitutes, which sustains the laws of physics, which holds the external world in balance and ensures the order of things. This consciousness is eternal. It exists out of time and is ever-present. It is for Green the ultimate spiritual principle of all life. It is quite simply a divine force, or if you will, a god. Thus, the ultimate nature of reality is the spiritual principle of the cosmic consciousness. And this is Green's ontology, the ultimate sustaining essence of things, the eternal cosmic consciousness. Let me quote Green himself. If by nature, he writes, we mean the object of possible experience, the connected order of knowable facts or phenomena, and this is what our men of science mean by it when they trace the natural genesis of human character, then nature implies something other than itself, as a condition of its being what it is. Of that something else, we are entitled to say positively that it is a self-distinguishing consciousness, because the function which it must fulfil in order to render the relations of phenomena, and with them nature, possible, is one which, on however limited a scale, we ourselves exercise in the acquisition of experience, and exercise only by means of such a consciousness. All things that exist must reside in the cosmic conscious mind, and this includes the minds of each individual person. Individual perceiving minds are thus part of the single conscious mind. Each individual consciousness, when it organises reality and holds object simulations, is moving towards the complete and rational system of the conscious mind. Over time, as humans deepen their understanding of reality, discovering new laws and making ever greater relational sense of the world, their minds move towards unity with the cosmic mind. Human minds can never fully realise the cosmic mind. Our cognitive faculties are too limited, too dependent on our sensory system. But still, humans can over time grow into an ever greater conformity with the cosmic mind, and that is the progress of rational thought on Earth, the progressive realisation of human understanding through history. In this way, Green is able to reconcile a belief in a cosmic deity with the development of modern science. Scientific knowledge, knowledge is not, as many often tend to assume, at variance with the existence of a divine spiritual principle. Quite the opposite. It is the divine spiritual principle that makes the orderly, predictable, law-based system of nature possible to begin with. And the growth of scientific knowledge does not take us away from God, but towards him. The more we know the rational system of reality, the more we know the cosmic consciousness that is the ultimate condition of the world including, of course, ourselves. In Hegelian terms, our ideas approximate ever more closely to the absolute idea of spirit, which is, which is of course, reality. One could probably see here how Green's metaphysics of the cosmic consciousness lead quite naturally to a series of ethical propositions. The central point is the fact that because the conscious self is the condition for the world of experience, it is not itself a part of it. It is not part of the objective world of relations of cause and effect, but rather makes this world. The conscious self is an active principle that makes reality. It is not determined by it. Hence, the conscious self is free, free to posit its own end 
and will its own objectives. And because the conscious mind can will as it wishes, it is responsible for what it does, and so can be held up for praise or blame. Free actions are moral actions, and so ethics is possible. Now anyone familiar with the work of Hegel will see obvious similarities between the systems of Hegel and Green. Like Hegel, Green holds that the underlying essence of the world is rational consciousness, that history is the process by which individual human minds come to realise, through their free, rational activity, the cosmic consciousness, and thereby manifest through their own minds the conscious spirit of the universe which is Hegel's absolute spirit. Now, I do not propose here to embark upon any extended criticism of these arguments, but there is, for me, one serious problem with Green's reasoning. He first explains how the world of experience, as we know it, is a complex, integrated world consisting of relations between objects, and that such a world can only exist if a conscious mind operates to organise and hold together the relations between objects. This is Green's epistemology, his theory of knowledge, and has, I think, much to recommend it. However, Green then brings in a reality outside of the individual conscious mind, which is the world of permanent relations. He then says, that because this external world consists of relations, it too must be underpinned by a conscious mind. There must therefore be a cosmic consciousness giving form to the universe. Now this reasoning is very much like that of those deists who inferred from the fact that a clock has a clockmaker that the universe must have a maker too. The point here is that Green has jumped from an epistemology of experience to an ontology of the ultimate nature of things. But of course, how can Green know the ultimate nature of things outside of experience, since according to his own theory, we can only know the world of experience? The world of experience, all experience, consists of relations between perceived objects because this is, as Green contends, the way our minds constitute reality as such. Reality, says Green, is mind-dependent. Being mind-dependent, the world exists in relations. That is, according to Green, the only way we could perceive it. In which case, the permanent relations of reality are exactly what the mind has made, and are product of the human consciousness. There are in no sense an argument for the existence of a cosmic mind. Now Green was a man of great religious faith, and we cannot but assume that he found God in the universe because he wanted to find God there, not because his theory necessitated or even had room for a deity. Thank you.